buenas tardes. Bienvenidos al Instituto Cervantes de Nueva Delhi. Bueno, well, we will shift to English, because today's talk will be in English, not in Spanish. But it's a great honor to have Professor Arvind Sharma with us today here. Because, well, he's one of the greatest scholars in cooperative religion. In fact, um, his whole life is very interesting, as I found, you know, and can be divided in four different periods. He was born in, in, in Baranasi, and at the, in the first period of his life, he joined the Indian Administrative Service in '62, and he worked as an officer six years, I think, till 1968. And then after that, I think he had a kind of re revelation, something like that, because he decided to move to New York, to the University of Syracuse, and to study economics. In fact, he obtained a master in economics. He had earlier a bachelor's degree from Allahabad University. And while doing this master in economics in the States, in New York, his master dissertation was the Hindu scriptural value system and in Indian's economic development. And then his thesis then signaled a shift in his academic interest, and he started, began to be interested in religion. And he took a master in theological studies from the Harvard Divinity School. So he went from economics to theology, which is not a common term to do. And after that, you know, he went from theology to Sanskrit. He joined the Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies at Harvard University and obtained his PhD in, in a doctoral work focused on Abhinava's, Abhinava Gupta's commentary in the Bhagavad Gita. As you know, Abhinava Gupta is a great Kashmirian scholar, and he has a very brief but a very meaningful commentary on the Gita which I think you also translated. I don't know if you ever published that, and that would, be, that would be very interesting, because this is a very unique commentary by Abhinava Gupta. After that, he moved to Australia. He was appointed lecturer in Asian religions at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. And there, in 1985, he organized a special event to commemorate the bicentennial anniversary of Bhagavad Gita translation into English, which took first in 1785, the first one. After that, you know, he moved to Canada, where he was appointed associate professor in the Faculty of Religious Studies at McGill University in Montreal, and now he's a British professor of comparative religion there, where he stays. Although he more and more spends time in India. In Spanish, actually, we say it, there is a famous dictum in Spanish, which says, actually, it's in Catalan, it says, Roda al mon y torna al borde, which basically means you go around the world and then you come back to your village. <laughs> and it seems that that's what you are doing now with this desire to be, spend more, more time in your native India. He was instrumental in facilitating the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the World Religions. He has more than 45 books and co-authored more than six books and edited more than 36 books. Here's a long, a long, long, long list. I won't, I won't really tax you with reading the list, but I would only like to mention the last ones. No? This is his latest book. The religious tolerance, which is the topic of our talk today. But he has edited, uh, he has also written The Rural's Gaze, a study of British rule over India from a Saidian perspective. Also, Gandhi, a spiritual biography, Hinduism and its sense of history, and decolonizing Indian studies. I think that are your latest. Yes, yes. Decolonizing Indian studies. Well, um, um, as I said, it was really a pleasure to have him here. I met him a few weeks ago. And I was very much um, surprised by this book. It's a, I think it's an important book 
as it is the need of the time, actually, this religious tolerance more than ever. And also because we are always, we Spanish here in India, are always looking for connections between India and Spain. As Professor Dingra knows very well here, I will also to salute, I mean, I mean, Mrs. Tripathi was ambassador of India in Madrid. And as you know very well, we all know, we are always searching for connections between India and Spain because connections are not easy to be found. Our countries have been apart all through the history. We didn't have so much relations. We were not the Portuguese, we were not the British. And I was struck by one of his commentaries inside here when he said, two parts of the world where Islam had a prolonged presence in a religious plural environment belong to extreme eastern and western parts of expansion of early Islam. India in the east and Spain in the west. That's a very important thing because in these places, Islam was present in Spain for eight centuries, in India still here. And Islam was living in a multi-religious environment. And it had to adapt to that circumstances and we have a very, very interesting response to that. In Spain, we have the concept of convivencia. It is said that during the, the Islamic era, at least a part of it, not all of it, but especially you know, during the first centuries, a kind of, of very um, tripartite culture flourish in Spain, and you can see that in cities like Toledo, when you have Christians, Muslims, and Jews living together. Still, you can see the synagogue there. You can see the mosque turned into church of Cor Cordoba. When you will still now see, at the same time, Islamic architecture and Christian architecture under the same roof. Now it's been turned into a church, but where the Islamic the Islamic symbols are there still for everybody to be seen. So this is a very interesting concept of vivencia, as it was practiced in Spain during Islamic rule. Some people may say that this convivencia is a myth of the 19th century of the romantic vision of Islamic Spain. But many of the people who say that, they also rely on another myth, which is the myth of the Reconquista of Spain by and, and Christian troops. So that's a lot of, there is a lot of debate, but um, I was very inspired by these comments by Professor Sharma, so we invited him to talk about convivencia and religious tolerance. A big applause for our guest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar, for the kind introduction. Uh, and for giving me this opportunity. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. That was here. Yeah. And giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you here. Uh, as often happens uh, uh, in these matters, although the title originally thought of was uh, from Convivencia to Religious Tolerance, okay. I think it was more appropriate <laughs> to describe what I'm going to discuss as a move from religious tolerance to convivencia. Uh, though I do use the word convivencia to mean more than mere coexistence. Yeah. It's a kind of a celebration of diversity uh, or harmony. Uh, so the point I'm going to pick up today for discussion is how can one move from, uh, from ideas of religious, mere religious tolerance taking tolerance in its original meaning of putting up with something you don't really want to but have to for various reasons uh, to the idea of uh, celebrating uh, religious diversity in particular context and uh, while I was thinking about this I thought of three avenues through which you could move from religious tolerance to convivencia. And one of them I identify as secularism. How a secular worldview would enable us to move from mere tolerance to celebration of plurality and diversity. Uh, the second approach I have here 
is Hinduism. Because Hinduism, especially its modern version, has always claimed almost, uh, not exclusively, but primarily, uh, identifies itself as a tolerant tradition. So if you bring in the Hindu idea, then where do we get as we move from tolerance to convivence? And the third avenue to explore the theme, I have identified as humanism. So secularism, Hinduism, and humanism will provide the three broad headings under which I will present my material. Now, let us first begin with secularism. Secularism, of course, is closely associated with the Western liberal tradition. And uh, let us see what's involved here, basically. You have one phase of European history where you try to establish not exactly convivence here, in the sense of celebrating the diversity of different religions, but celebrating the acceptance of one religion by a community or a political territory in all its richness. This was the Christian model. Uh, so the Rome, uh, actually I think it was uh, at some point uh, in the fourth Fourth century, uh, you have to be a Christian under pain of death. That is, if you're not a Christian, you could be killed. So naturally, everybody became a Christian. With the exception of very remarkable, the exception of Judaism. But Judaism, in its, way, in its own way, is a witness to Christianity. And of course, there is the irony that Christianity arose in a religiously poor environment. But the success of Christianity in it is good. But to look at it in a positive light, and you have a whole community uh, whose religious aspiration is in sync. Everybody is in sync with everybody else. Now, when this model started failing to work in Europe, especially with the rise of the Protestant movement. Uh, that is when you have this whole problem of how do you accommodate various Christian sects? It's a very interesting point. So all the theme is within the Christian fold, the way it started. started. And then you have the idea of uh, the rulers, everybody follows the rulers of the Westphalia Treaty and so on. Uh, that doesn't work because of printing and mobility and everything, uh, because of what is now called marbling, that in any particular region in the world, you have followers of other religions. Howsoever religion you might try to be in keeping them out, you will find some of them there. And this was happening in Europe with the sects. They couldn't be kept bound to these states. So the question was, how do we deal with this plurality? Christian plurality. And the approach which evolved was that the state which uh, has been tied to uh, Christianity for a long time uh, needs to be re envisioned to solve this problem and not committed to any particular Christian sect. And how does one do that? The state has no religion of its own. It's a, it's a secular concept of the state. Its business is to the administration and so on. Provide, uh, uh, provide uh, safety from external invasion and uh, internal disorder. And create an environment in which people could uh, work out their goals, various goals in life, 
and, uh, and the, the, the modicum of prosperity. So when we take this, this kind of a thing, sorry, that, so I'm picking the two words. If we take this kind of a perspective on secularism, then it does not seem to be very hospitable to the idea of convivency uh, because it seems to be restricted to one religion. But as we all know, this Christian model has now become globalized. Uh, and secularism is an idea which other parts of the world have also embraced. That is, the state has no religion of its own. Now here we get into uh, the nomenclatural problem. How do we understand secularism? Uh, and how a particular understanding of secularism leads to a certain concept of harmonious coexistence. Now, three main ideas are associated with the idea of secularism. One is that the state has no religion of its own. State has no religion. The second is that uh, religious life of the individual ceases to be a matter in the public sphere. The privatization of religion idea. And the state, in a sense, is not interested in religion because religion has become a private matter. Everybody has their own view. Uh, and if you are mainly Christian country, everybody has their own perspective on Christianity. The third idea associated with uh, secularism has been secularization. a process by which areas of life which were earlier on under the control of the church pass under the control of the state. Education is a very good example. So we get these three strands of meaning in the world. Separately. Now the interesting thing in this is that if we now look back at secularism, after the rise of the religion and public life all over the world, over the, ever since the Iranian revolution, that this core idea of secularism, that the state should not have a religion, has caught on. Even when the states have a religion, as in England and some European countries, there are established churches. There are two established churches in Britain. Many of these Scandinavian countries have established churches. It is merely a historical relic. It plays no actual role in what the state does. Even today, appointments in theology at Cambridge and Oxford are made by the ruler of England as a defender of the faith. just quaint. It has become a quaint fact of modern life because the fact of this linkage with the crown has no real effect on what goes on. There is a committee which decides to forward the name of the selector, selected person. It's pure formality now. Like the, uh, like the queen declaring the parliament open, things like that. Pure form. So even those states in Europe, which have formally not turned their back on the link between religion and the state, hardly use religion as the basis of their activity as a state. So this is, I think, a major contribution of secular thought to the world. And still holds good. The other ideas 
of uh, privatization of religious life and the secularization of the world have not come to pass so far. See, uh, after the Second World War, it was an unstated assumption of social sciences in the West that Europe's past was the world's future. And Europe's past in this case was it's turning its back on religion. So that the whole world will get secularized. And religion will cease to yeah, play the role it does or has played so far. Now that has not happened. The privatization has not happened and religion has not disappeared from uh, public life. Life has not in general become secularized as was hoped. One time. So the second and third points have not stood the test of time, but the first one has. So now we take the question of the first one and see how we move along that territory, uh, or in that territory. How far can we go towards convivencia from toleration? Because you can see that the basic, basic impulse of secularism in the beginning was to we tolerate religion, but let's keep it out of this. You know? state matters. It's a fact of life here. Yeah, you know, we hold our nose and pass on. <laughs> now, this attitude of the relationship of the state to religion has given rise to three forms of secularism, I would argue. What we might call neutral secularism, what we might call negative secularism, and what we might call positive sector. Now the best example I can think of of neutral secularism, that is the relationship between the state and religion is really neutral, is America and the First Amendment. And the Congress shall make no law. Regarding the establishment of a church in India, or preventing the free exercise thereof. What are known as the, uh, the disestablishment clause and the free exercise clause. So, state cannot have any religion, but the state will not interfere with religion either. Seems like a very fair deal. That's what I think uh, has been described as the uh, war of separation by Jefferson. And the many people like to point out that there are many holes in this wall, but the overall concept is of this wall of separation. So this in this particular understanding of neutral secularism, uh, the religions are left free as in America to develop under the new dynamics. And it might lead to a, excuse me, a very harmonious relationship among the various citizens. But in any case, the state is going to make sure that they don't, uh, uh, that it does not give rise to a friction that interferes with public life. It has to maintain law and order, things like that. So it was maximum freedom, short of disturbances in law and order. And whether it ends up in a celebration, you know, or in a kind of a cold standoff is not its concern. The second form of secularism is negative secularism, and I think the erstwhile communist countries are a very good example of it. They did not have any religion of their own, but they were also hostile to religion. Their official doctrine often was atheism. So I don't think I need to say one on that, it's fairly obvious. But the third possibility of positive secularism is interesting. Huh? Because many people have argued that this is what we have in India. It may not be in the constitution as such. But there is a basic understanding that it is the role of the state to promote religious harmony. Huh? Coming together of the various religions in peace. It's 
certainly the kind of idea which a person like Gandhi would have approved of. So, by the secular route, we can move from religious tolerance to convivencia if we adopt the third approach. Uh, positive secular, what I have called positive secular, for want of a better word. So we can, in a secular dispensation, uh, move from secularism, uh, sorry, in a secular dispensation from uh, tolerance, or let's call it near tolerance, to convivencia as we understand it, in a positive sense. So that's part one. So, I'll just sit down to part, to think about Hinduism. Now, Hinduism, uh, of course, there is a very long history. Um, but the point I would like to dwell on at this moment is modern Hinduism. This is the name we give to Hinduism from 1800 onwards. The form the traditional religions of India took, which we call broadly Hindu. And the word is often used to include uh, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. The form these religions assumed after the encounter with the West through British colonialism, with Christianity, with science and technology. And so, so we are dealing with modern period of Hinduism, what we call modern. In that also we have a divide, which is very really obvious now. There is an ethnic version of that modern Hinduism, which is associated with the Hindu right. But there is the broader uh, version, which is often referred to as and universal Hinduism. Hinduism being okay, often described as a whole law, or try to provide scope for all sorts of views. And so within it typically, what to us would appear contradictions to begin with are really perceived as options. From its perspective. So in that spirit of uh, universal Hinduism leads it to being often described as pluralism, what is often referred to as Hindu pluralism. Now we need to spend a little time on this word pluralism, because it holds the key to some of the points here about what or secret. Now, We have to backtrack a bit. When Christianity, Western Christianity started coming in contact with non Christian religion in a major way, after the rise of the modern West, the question arose in the Christian circles of what is going to be our attitude towards these other non Christian religions? And Christian theology developed three kinds of three strands in this context. One which was called, is called exclusivism now. And the second one, which is called inclusivism, and the third one, which is called pluralism. This is the background. It is important to have this background. It reminds us that the origin of these terms is Western, that is used a lot in India and Asia. And not only Western, it's in Christian theology. So that's a good reminder. And uh, that the meaning of these words has a very specific connotation in Christian theology. The issue is, how are you going to be saved? Or what is called soteriology. So a group of Christian beliefs, or belief, and also beliefs, and that in order to be saved, 
you have to be Christian. There is no salvation outside the church. That was continuing in the world. So that's called exclusive. The second uh, attitude is attitude is represented by the word uh, inclusivism. That is, of course, we are the best supreme tradition. But other traditions can be looked upon as preparing the way. The productive evangelica, preparing the way for the acceptance of Christianity. So they do have value. In the first approach, they have no value. And exclusive. In inclusivism, they have provisional value. And you can build upon that. And so you can deal with Hindus and Christians, sorry, and Buddhists and Muslims and so on, on this basis. So Christianity still is the most effective uh, way of achieving salvation to be saved. Others cannot be saved as they are, but they are harm where they are. And we have to now make sure that they reach the end under our aegis. The third position is called pluralism. That all major religions of the world are equally effective in securing salvation of the faith. gone beyond theology into the study of religion in general, even into sociology and so on. Uh, so you have, uh, you have exclusivism, inclusivism, and truth. Now, pluralism could either be accepted as a fact, and then you lose interest, you can find your interest to have more path. Uh, without any hostility to other path, because they are also effective for their own followers. Or you might have a more positive attitude towards this fact that all these various religions are right. How wonderful. Start looking at them in this sense, then you are moving in the direction of universalism. Now it is here that Hinduism offers a very interesting uh, insight. I would even say insight. It says that there are two kinds of universalism. And a good illustration of the differences between these two would be two statements I'm going to make now. English is a universal language. Maybe it's not, but you know, that's what English is a universal language. And the second statement is religion is a universal phenomenon. Or better still, language at this stage. Language is a universal phenomenon. The word universal has been used in both these right? But can you sense the difference in meaning? In one case, it is one element of a collection which replaces all others. This is one kind of universal. You might call it celestial universal. One sky without any differences within it. One religion, one language, a world global state, you know, that's straight. A celestial universalism. There is a universalism of the terrestrial the universalism of the earth. The earth is everywhere, but sometimes there's a lake, sometimes there's a mountain. It's also it's also universal. But the way it is universal is very different from the way the sky is. 
that Hinduism has always maintained that the universalism, it of course, is the second thing. It accepts differences and does not eliminate. So if we move along this line, then you will never think about, Hinduism will never think about any religion becoming a universal religion, or even Hinduism becoming a universal religion. Because that falsifies its basic position. What you convert to, if you accept the Hindu position, is not to a universal religion, but to religious universalism. To start accepting the validity of other religions also. Now, this line was carried in a very interesting direction by Mahatma Gandhi. And his thought in modern India is expressed by three terms. Uh, various, we, all these three ideas are found in Gandhi. But I think we find it very interesting to calibrate them. And all these three expressions I'm going to use, which are Basically, Sanskrit expression also used in Hindi and other languages in India. That what should be the question is what should be the attitude of this kind of universalist Hindu towards other religions? So you can claim that the attitude should be Sarvathar, all religions, Sambha. You have equal respect for that. Equality of order. But then another term is used in some circles. Sarvadhan, origin, sadhva, goodwill towards all. Not just the idea I have an equal. A good way, sadhva. And finally, we come to the real Gandhian spin on this. Sarvadhan Mamba. Mamba is I mine. The attitude that all the religions of the world are mine. All these, these are individual religions are mere values. Mine too. And all the religions of the world are mine. And towards the end of his life, this was a very clear position. In a public address in Andhra Pradesh, towards the end of his life, he told the people uh, that I am a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Jain, a Sikh, a Muslim, a Christian, a Western, etc. And so are you. Pointing to the audience. He made the same claim before Kaidi Adam Jinnah, for the Muslim being in his talks. And Kaidi Adam had a very interesting response. And that brings us back to our theme. This is a very Hindu thing to say. <laughs> so we can move from Hinduism to, uh, for, uh, yeah, sorry, from religious tolerance to convivencia under the rubric of Hinduism through the universal option, and especially as developed by God. That's quite clear. Now we come to the third part of the presentation. And here, we take up the question of humanism as an approach to religious terrorism. Now, human rights, discourse, human rights discourse is, of course, modern discourse. The ancient rules and precedents, but its formalization is modern. And it coincides with the breakdown of the one church model for the religious peace, only Christianity, only Islam, in the modern world. The emergence of the world. And so, tolerance becomes the main uh, in humanist discourse. The uh, discussion in Europe among the scholars in the Enlightenment. Uh, 
if you examine it from this perspective, it's quite remarkable on the use of the word tolerance. Almost all the countries in Europe, especially Western Europe, are invoking this term, right from Mill in uh, England to Voltaire, France, and so on. There's a very interesting book with the title, How the Idea of Religious Tolerance Came to the West, which documents this work and how it connects with humanism. Now, the universal definition of human rights uh, moves from the idea of tolerance to freedom. So there is a movement towards greater acceptance of the differences and then not correcting. Everybody has a right to freedom of conscience, belief, religion. And so this is where we are at in this. But I'm going to push this now, this line of art, and try to demonstrate how Humanism can also be leaders from tolerance uh, to convivencia. To make that move, I'd like to ask the question, which is the more fundamental category that I am a Buddhist? or that I'm a human being. What do you think? Which of these two is the more fundamental category? I would suggest that I am a human being is more fundamental because you can be a human being without being a Buddhist, but you can't be a Buddhist without being a human being. And this is when you say that I think human is foreign to be the famous statement from the world. So if your primary identity in this context becomes human and not uh, of your own reason, then does it not follow that you are the legacy as a human, at least, and not a human being? of all the religions of humanity simultaneously. And if this is so, then can you still say that Islamic fundamentalism or terrorism is an Islamic problem? Isn't it your problem also? If you are the legacy of all the religions of the world, then all the achievements are yours, then all the problems are also yours. This is about as far as I am willing to go to this point at the moment. So I leave it there, I relinquish there. But it does lead us to very interesting vistas. Let me push this side. So, uh, time to conclude now. So we see, we find them that each form, each of these uh, forms of uh, secularism, Hinduism, and humanism, which enable us to move from tolerance to convivencia, have their own flavor. They bring us to the same dining table. the center. I guess it is all the time to say. So let's have some discussion. Thanks very much, Professor Sharma. I think it's been a master class.
And you have provided us with a very strong theoretical framework. I mean, we've seen here the professor speaking, I mean, there's a lot of experience behind these words. And I think it's given, you know, like a framework. I open the floor, okay, for questions, please, over there. Pass the mic to him, otherwise we won't. Please introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Shirin Nandi. I'm a, uh, I guess I'm a man of science. Uh, as I preface this question, um, I'm, I'm very, very upset that I missed the uh, parking issues for the first 15 minutes. Is there any way that this can be the first 15 minutes can be? This is recorded, so you can watch it on YouTube. It's being recorded, it will be on available on YouTube. Okay. I, I, I really thought this was a total force, and thank you very much, Professor Sharma. But I would take issue with uh, with your last point, which I think on which rests rests the argument. And and, and the point is, are uh, when uh, under what theoretical framework do we think of ourselves in, in answering a question? The question, for example, that you posed, that are we a Buddhist or or are we first. a or, or, are first? or are we a human first? And I would posit that. And I think I'm not willing to say that a Buddhist, but I was certainly a follower of Buddha, or even perhaps a Hindu, and I'd be interested in what you say, whether a Hindu would really think that they are a human first. Is, for example, not the idea of that we are a human, a, a consequence of, uh, uh, of the rise of sort of rationalism, of the idea, uh, of the idea that we are uh, atomized in some way, whereas, um, uh, a follower of Buddha might think that we are one with the universe and there is no boundary between uh, the self and, uh, and the environment. And perhaps a Hindu, and I'm, I don't know enough about this, would, would, would say that I, there is no difference between me, the, uh, the atom, and my family or my, my caste perhaps, and my, uh, uh, my, my creed and so on and so forth. So, so, and if I take issue with the idea that we are a human first, and, and then a Buddhist, then uh, does your argument uh, still resound? Sorry. So it's probably well and clear enough in this. I'm not trying to say that uh, a Buddhist or a Hindu arrives at this conclusion of his relationship to other religions through his religion. But I'm trying to argue that if you're a humanist, so that your primary and ultimate value is human, humanity, then this follows. So you have to presume that. Yes, <coughs> yes. Yeah. But if you, if you don't presume that, then there's no such no, but that is why, that is, why, no, no, no. that is precisely why I had a separate category for it. Yes. This is not a good answer. Yeah. This is under humanism. Yes. Uh, Professor Sharma, I wanted to ask you about Sufism. Someone as great as Hazrat Muzamuddin or the great works of Amir Khusro, doesn't it transcend all these divisions because it says Sarva Dharma Mahabharata is no division? Why is it that something like Hazrat Muzamuddin Sufism? has not taken over and conquered our imagination to the extent that it should have. Why do we all still think that I'm in the way of Buddhist, I'm Christian, I'm Protestant, I'm Catholic, instead of saying that you are the Lord and I look up to you, whoever is born to you. And that we are all together, bound by love. <coughs> well, if I understood your question correctly, uh, and then my response has to be that every religion, in some part of it, reaches that point yes. where it is self-transcending. Yeah. But then the question, historical question arises, did any Sufi apostatize? And if one of them did Sarma, he was killed by another thing. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, the, 
particularity of the tradition intervenes. It comes in the way. We cannot have a conference at the mountain top as it were. You can have it at slightly lower level. But it's not true that the uh, mystics there speak the same language in the mountain top? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, it is quite remarkable how similar these statements are uh, made, uh, made by the mystics in many traditions. In fact, it's quite startling at times. Uh, but there is also a school which maintains that we have overlooked the differences in the mysticisms of the various religions. It's an open debate. I think both sides have good arguments in this area. Just a, my question is a little more uh, basic, you could say. The former Spanish ambassador to India, Dr. Tindu Paz, has, has some very fine observations on religion in India and the coexistence of, ex of extremities. Now, in, in that context, while it's wonderful to have a, a framework, a theoretical framework of in which people are tolerating and accepting a universal identity. Like this, it takes two to tango. You might be accepting all religions, and Hinduism does. That's how the Dashavatar has come in. But the problem comes when you encounter something that refuses to be assimilated and refuses to engage in a discussion, argument, and presence and ultimate, you know, either me or nothing else. So in this framework, how do we deal with that? Because it is, I might be a very assimilative, tolerant, universalist human being, but to survive in this world, if I keep proclaiming it all over the place, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, not so a, it's not a, something on which I survive, right? Yeah, because so my, belief, my survival also depends on what you believe I should be. It's a vital question, uh, a life question. Uh, and I don't think I have any final answer to offer. But there are two things impressed me when I was writing this book on religious tolerance. And they might help us move a bit forward on that question. The first thing which is struck me was the importance of the state. We can almost say that the state of religious tolerance is a function of the state. I was not prepared for this when I began writing, called it by religious tolerance. But every, at every corner you run into this whole question. And the signal which the state gives. So that is one. And the second is, that all religious traditions have a tradition of religious tolerance. This actually the book documents that. So you and have, has all the three strands of exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. So uh, this is not a very sensational answer I'm going to give, but it is obvious first that if the state is committed to raise this harm. And it is really remarkable from that point of view that the two Muslim rulers, about whom we have certain kind of legends I will share with you, are the two most tolerant rulers uh, in the Islamic period in India, Zainu Nabidin of Kashmir and Akbar of India proper. And separated by the almost just a century, even less. About both of these, the Hindu tradition is, now in the Bhavishya Purana, that both of these were originally Hindus in their previous lives, who wanted to take a certain kind of rebirth, but on account of the faulty use of ritual, they got born in a Muslim family. Yeah. So that there is the slightest indication of tolerance on the other side. Other traditions are, are like to reciprocate. 
and assimilate them. And the Bhavishpura are actually all the major figures in the court of Akbar are identified with major worshippers of Krishna in Vrindavan, who were all reborn with him. So this is one point. Yeah, that is. That is uh, it's the second point. Each has the tradition of dominance, including Islam. And actually all Islam I should mention, because everybody talks in India about the destruction of temples. It is on record that the Muslim rulers in Iran had a Zoroastrian temple rebuilt, which had been demolished by a Muslim law. As documented there. Such was their commitment to their version of religious dualism. And this brings me to the final point, the third point. The other thing I discovered in this book is that you are more persuasive in dealing, in inducing another, tolerant, another religion to be tolerant, which is obviously the subtext of what you are saying, by pointing out that by giving material or evidence from their own tradition as proof of their attitude. You are more convincing to a Christian that Christians should practice religious tolerance in relation to other religion by giving the evidence from Christianity rather than using a secular argument. Use an internal argument of the tradition. Sometimes our vision is so colored by what we read all the time. I am going to make the claim here that there is a religious text in the great religions of the world which at two places claims clearly return even with that which is better. What would be that text? We all know that it is in my way. What could be that text? I ask you to guess. I think the tendency would be to go to the Bible, somewhere on the Mount. It must be the Quran. It is in the Quran. Two places. I usually takes my class by complete surprise. So, to the extent, if you want to persuade the other person to come to the table uh, in terms of tolerance and dialogue, then I think we, we get further by using arguments from the person's own tradition then by inducing evidence from either secular or other tradition. And the state of consciousness. Uh, the state of consciousness, absolutely. In practical terms. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sharma, for your excellent expose on convivencia. I think it is a very, very relevant topic in these days. Uh, I would like to know your opinion on, uh, on the state of uh, religious fundamentalism. Do you think it is rising in the world, uh, especially in the case of India? And what are the reasons or causes in your opinion? No, there are several sub-questions in this. <laughs> OK. So why is there a rise in religious fundamentalism? And the case of India. Yeah. Now, I am personally of the view that secular fundamentalism is a fundamental factor which has led to the rise of religious fundamentalism. <coughs> what the secular worldview does is to challenge and even more than that, deny the validity of the religious dimension of human life. I hope you are all with me on this. A liberal Western tradition 
says that religion will ultimately become a private. The Marxist tradition even talks about the disappearance. Okay. Now, if we look at human nature, which are certain components, and those components may not all be visible at a particular time. I'll give you an example. Things will be universal without being interested in wealth and power, pursuing wealth and power. That is Artha. All of us want to have a good time. That is calm. And all of us see some kind of an answer to the mystery of life. What are we? Why are we here? Where are we going? Is Dharma of Kham and Mokshi? And the fact that there are four is emphasized, and that sometimes they could be in conflict with us, like a nine and all. So the goal is the harmonious pursuit of these four goals. The fact that there are four is very useful at this point in discussing what has happened in the rest. Basically, if you believe only in Dharma, as a constituent of human personality. What happens? You become a fundamentalist. Dharma religion. That is the PN, be all and end all. And that is the only valid goal of life. You end up along that route becoming a pandemic. If you believe only in power, you end up becoming a Marxist. If you believe only in uh, uh, wealth, you end up becoming a capitalist. Just take it to this end. <coughs> You take calm, you become a hedonist. Intellectual terms, you become a Freudian. Artha <laughs> in intellectual terms, you become a Marxist. In Dharma, in, yeah, you become somebody like Kutub. The uh, intellectual founder of uh, the brother. Muslim brotherhood in Egypt. Theology. And if you believe only in moksha, your salvation, you know, and then you become otherworldly. It's only the other world values. Because I see this. 
So the point, all four are constituents of human personality. You can have a long and a short So the fact that for a certain field in human history, uh, religion seemed to be, religion had actually overplayed its hand earlier when things which do not fall in the realm of religion were brought into it. So there is a reaction to that. And now, the secular denial of religiosity for that whole realm of the good and the bad, the ultimate, the meaning of life. There is a rebound. So this, for me, is a broadest explanation of religious fundamentalism. One point. Point regarding India, I personally feel that the rise of uh, secular fundamentalism in India, especially after the independence, <coughs> is the direct result of asymmetrical secular secularism in India. Asymmetrical. How many of us here know that the money, the offerings which Hindus make, at the temples, ultimately end up as salaries to imams and Christian pastors in West Bengal and Andhra. Is this secularism? You will say, how does this happen? Sounds incredible. The government, governments of various states in India, not the central government, state governments. Southern state, 90,000 Hindu temples are run by the state. In South India. If you have this discipline, nobody touches the waqf, nobody touches the mosques, nobody touches the chassis. The latest move by the Uttarakhand government, which I believe is the basic BJP government, was to take over the temples of the state because they are a cash cow. And all the money goes into general coffers. I'm sure some of it also goes to build houses and you know, hospitals and all. But imagine if people, if this was brought to public knowledge, that the money which the Hindus are paying, yeah, are offering in the temples, are ending up the way I pointed it out. Can you imagine the reaction to that? But this is happening right now. In BJP government. And the BJP. So this asymmetric of secularism is really in great danger. And the education institutions is another way. And the law, the temple law for one community and personal law and you know. So my view, personal view is that everything was okay at the time of independence. Mahatma Gandhi's sacrifice, etc. But the asymmetric, the persistent asymmetric is Final point about this, Hindu fundamentalism has a very quaint characteristic. There is no fundamental in Hinduism. What do I mean by that? If you are a Christian, then you can point to the fundamentals of Christianity. There is the Bible, there is Jesus. Yeah. If you are a Muslim fundamentalist, you can point to the fundamentals of Islam. There is the Quran, there is the Hadith, to be accepted by all Muslims and they are uh, Christian. What is there in Hinduism? So Hindu fundamentalism has a very peculiar characteristic. Fundamentalism results from two things. A sense of loss of power by a community and a sense of loss of piety. Though the second one is properly called orthodoxy. In Hindu fundamentalism, it's almost all about power. So it's, when you compare it with the other fundamentalism, you have to give this in mind. At least so far it has been like, you know, somebody comes up and, you know, 
Ojek Hindus have been such a way that 99% of the Hindus start accepting that, at least for the time being, in a different kind of environment. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that very interesting discussion. So I wish to first uh, go back to one of the uh, sort of early points you made during your exposition uh, relating to uh, the historical roots of uh, secularism in the Western context. And I was thinking especially of Locke's essay on toleration rather than tolerance and how that separation of church and state came about. And I think one of the key aspects of that was, in fact, the religious warfare that racked Europe in the medieval era. So that actually necessitated that. It was not merely a function of Christianity's existence and of development in a certain kind of uh, way. It was intense uh, warfare and religious warfare. That was Christian sectarian warfare. Yes, okay, Christian victory, but also I think what happened with respect to the Ottoman Empire and the you know destruction of what had become in Spain a syncretic culture after the elimination pretty much of that, with the pushing out of even the Morris course, a uh, certain kind of model of syncretism which might have become the uh, norm was destroyed. Effectively, there's a homogenization therefore of uh, European culture in a certain uh, way. Uh, and. Uh, so, so we have those traces left behind, perhaps, in the case of those churches uh, and uh, mosques, which uh, sort of were mentioned, Cordoba and uh, all of the rest of that, Andalusian cultures, evidence of that. But uh, much of it was effectively uh, demolished and uh, erased from from the memory. So, uh, effectively, uh, syncretism went uh, uh, sort of uh, out of the window. Uh, in the, in contrast, in the subcontinental sort of space especially in the constitutional debates which took place, as we were really recently reminded of by Dr. Karan Singh, who's uh, in a recent book. Uh, so he mentioned the fact that, especially in Ambedkar's uh, intervention, there was a clear emphasis on this idea of accommodation. And that, of course, also sprang from Gandhi's idea of accommodation of difference. Uh, so therefore, there's a sense of, as you say, Sarvatham Zamba, as a necessity to ensure the ability to coexist especially again in the context of a very severe trauma which occurred, that is the partition of India and the accompanying violence that of course took place then. So my question would be then, are we not, are you in your presentation, are we not in our sort of construction of this sort of somewhat uh, idyllic sometimes, some ways a view of especially the Hindu uh, tradition, underestimating the sort of role that conflict has played and especially the mutation of conflict in the 20th century into genocidal violence. Uh, and in more recent times that has taken a particular form. I think uh, 2002 is one example of that. The recent Delhi riots could be seen in that time. Sorry to bring in recent happenings, but since it's a phenomenon we're all witnessing at close hand, uh, it's, it's not the same old kind of rioting, it's not the same old kind of violence. It's a new form, it's taking on the element of power is certainly there, but it's also about eliminating the other and also about assuming a certain kind of righteousness with respect to how you treat the other. So that, is that something new, uh, which then actually uh, sort of means that uh, you know, religion itself has mutated into something monstrous, something quite uh, disparate from what it once might have been, and Hinduism in particular. Well, actually, the question basically is uh, the difference between Hinduism and Hindu thought. Yeah. That's what it is. Okay. Now, uh, this is of course very contentious. Contentious questions. Walking into these minefields. Now, uh, the poet, I can only share my views on this. I cannot offer you as a dictum. What struck me most about this when I was reading, I listened to the piece on that. crucial element in the distinction is how seriously are you going to take the history of perceived Hindu suffering at the during periods of Muslim rule, Christian rule, and I would dare say even secular rule, now after our facts. How seriously are you going to take this trauma? There is one school if there is no trauma. 
Why don't you do it right? We're absolutely pointless. And the other school says, no, in all the three periods, we are done seeing it. Now, those who say that are in the toilet. Yes. So it boils, all boils down to, are you prepared to accept the idea of Hindu trauma? And to what extent? One, some might say there was no trauma, this is all, uh, you know, either British historians they wrote something up, or right-wing history, Hindu historians wrote something up, and uh, there is a conform to facts, it could be that. But it is perceived as a major trauma. Otherwise, it's very hard to explain what is going on. So, what are you going to do with it? Are we going to take it on board or not? The moment it, will be, it is taken on board, seriously, I can assure you from uh, the experience of South Africa, at least, but I can't really assure you, but we have some hope from the experience of South Africa. Uh, where that kind of history was dealt with in a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And not in the denial mode. Not because you believe. You may, in your heart of heart believe that everything was fine. But you accept the fact that it is felt as a grievance by a substantial body of the community. So you take it on board. Now what happened is, this is an interesting part. Very fascinating in South Africa. The moment the people said that, yes, we are guilty of the crimes, yeah. the entire atmosphere in the media changed. What happens is when you say that, then the accusers suddenly so realize that you are a human being. Right? And I'm also a human being. I also completely respect it. So a new dynamic comes in, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, let's deal with this. Now you do this, you do that, and this is how we make up. But the crucial thing is this acceptance, acknowledgement. Many people have rightly pointed out that if what happened to you in their case, if the original suggestion you know, that uh, a, a land be given to the Muslim community for moving there, mosque there, and Hindus be allowed to do this, if that had been accepted, the whole situation would have been different because it implied the acceptance of the idea that many temples were destroyed. If the offer had come from the other side, or had accepted the other, other side, okay. So if we get into that kind of dynamic through this truth and reconciliation, then I think there is hope for, for the movement. Well, let's finish here. I think it's been a very interesting session. One last question, very fast because we are running out of time. Please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor Sharma. And uh, on behalf of Cervantes, because I'm part of Cervantes, I'm working here. And um, it was really nice to hear your views
So how will we directly become humans? How can we adopt humanism just like that? So do you think that the tool has to be first utilized and then become secular and or a human and then arrive at harmony? Which of course is a end. And how are you going to just achieve, you know, achieve the end? What means are we going to use? So I see that uh, just like you said, that four goals, you know, should be all universal. I mean, you should be aiming at all four goals. So I see here that even three parts somewhere emerging. I just wanted to. Yes, my purpose uh, in the, behind this presentation was not to uh, come up with a solution to the problem. It was just to illustrate, uh, explore uh, uh, how we could move from, it was a theoretical exercise in this sense, how could we move from tolerance uh, to convivencia under these three major modes of thought, which are currently there, to uh, secularism, Hinduism, and humanism. And I found it interesting that all three leave us room in, in some understandings of uh, within them for moving from tolerance to convivencia. Now, convivencia is not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It yeah, has the ability to deal conflict. with, con resolve conflict. So, uh, so that was what I was attempting. Uh, what are the larger issue which has been raised by you and by others also? So how do we deal with it in real life? Uh, this might sound uh, almost like a homily or something, <laughs> church pulpit or something. But the other day, I ran into a statement in the Chando Upanishad, which struck me as very hard. It's a very short statement, and those in the audience who are familiar with Indian languages are be able to get the meaning right away. Smarad way, Asha, Bhuvasi, hope is greater than memory. Well, I think that, that you know, nothing else can be said now. <laughs> Only to say that your words, your intervention, you know, give us a lot of hope. And, and, and really, and not, I would say, you know, uh, 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 an empty hope, but a hope with a very strong reasoning, a very strong argumenting, and, and, and a really a very deep theoretical framework. Thanks very much for your words. Before, um, I would like, we would like to give a memento from the Cervantes Institute, from the most tolerant writer that Spain has, which is Miguel de Cervantes. We are very happy to give you Donkey shot, the happy version of it. I hope you have a proper translation of it. I hope you have a translation of it. That's your own translation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.